These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is I Do Not Belong Here, written by Michael Pearson and narrated by James Barnett. There's a simple formula to fame and attention. The bigger the tragedy, the bigger the celebrity. And I wasn't going to share my celebrity with anyone. What's sadder than three abandoned children? One. That's what. We'd been locked away in our suburban house our whole life. There was nothing spectacular about it. But that's the secret to blending in, right? To not being seen. To not being caught. Blend in. Be beige. Beige walls. Beige carpet. Beige personalities. I'd spend hours and hours watching celebrities on the magic portal. That's right. The portal. I didn't call it a TV back then. They told us it was a gateway into their world and the only safe way we could watch them. One of the vocabulary wonders our parents gifted us in our incarceration. With everything so bland, how could I not be hypnotised by these creatures so colourful? I'd watch with peeled back eyelids and grin a stupid grin, imagining being just the famous. They had freedom. They had fortune. They had all the food they could want and not want. It was everything I didn't have, so of course I wanted all of it. I remember the realisation as I perched on our stained cord sofa. I'm sitting there, mouth open, amazed, when my sister points and asks me, Why do they wear clothes like that? We're watching someone walk on a red carpet with oversized hips, gigantic shoulders and in a shiny black material that made them walk robotically. They look unhappy for the whole affair, until the flashes flash them, and then suddenly they expose their super white teeth like they're ready to bite. It's so the flashes flash at them, I say, excited and entranced. They like it when people look at them. My sister goes on about how crazy and dangerous it is out there, and that's why we're better off in here. My brother tells us not to watch it at all. He says it's risky just to look at it. The portal might let something in, he says. But I don't care. I think it looks fun. I think it looks like my future. The day mother and father decided not to come home was a Tuesday. They said goodbye in a stern and upright manner, as they usually did. After father left with his bags, mother ran back and kissed me on the forehead for the first and only time I remember. She smiles in a way that makes me squint with suspicion. She kisses me and says, Go and be happy, son. I look at her confused. I don't know what the word son means at this point. I think she's talking about the sun in the picture books, and I'm baffled why she wants me to be a happy yellow circle with a big crisp grin. So, I grin and show my grey teeth because I think that it's what I should be doing. Now I know what a sun is. Now I know I wasn't a dwoog, as they usually called me. My sister wasn't a dwag. My parents definitely weren't my dwoogos. But these days it makes for a killer story at the parties everyone wants to be at. When I recount the word for blood, People ooze with intrigue. When I shout foreign curse words, they howl with delight. When I piss in the urinal and recap a different word for each shade of yellow, they gawp in disbelief. The day our parents left, we checked the cupboards and found seven days of eggs and rice remaining. My dwoodle, what I now call my brother, was the one that panicked through his militant commanding. He'd say things like reserves and rations, while pointing so hard his knuckles turned white. He'd say things like, 1800 hours and T minus 30 minutes, while I counted down the days. I was going to escape this dump and be a happy son. On the first night we're abandoned, my sister reminds us, as always, to lay the stones of protection. She acutely reminds us that they're the only thing between us and getting dragged back to hell for our demonly sins. She could never tell us what those demonly sins were. She says, three stones perfectly placed in front of our bedroom doors, and then checks each one before we all stand ready to say goodnight. But this night, she asks, what are we going to do when we run out of food? My brother says, we cannot leave under any circumstance. We'd get caught. And by we, he means us demons. 
as her parents like to call us. But we need to eat Doodle, my Dwaddle says. We're going to starve if we can't get any more Upsalu and Achaka. That's eggs and rice to you and me. My brother thinks and strains and sweats as he rolls his fingers into fists and I busily pick my ear. I'll think of a plan. I'll look after us, he says, and I yawn and go to bed. I had big plans of my own to think about. I watched my brother and sister slip into predictable panic over the next few days. They became noisier, then quieter, and then a bit of both. They thought they knew what was coming. Mother and father said demons aren't welcome here. We'd be spotted straight away, father told us. If we ever step outside or peer through the windows, blue and red lights would hunt us down. We'd be captured and tortured for the rest of our eternal lives. The humans wanted to keep all of their precious Upsalu and Achaka to themselves. My brother and sister waited for the inevitable, and I was too busy planning my escape. I studied the humans on TV while my brother and sister fell apart. These people looked important. I watched something called a gala and was awestruck at how simultaneously spectacular and ridiculous they looked. Hypnotized by their silly, glittery costumes and I would look down at my faded beige uniform with resentment. There's someone dressed as a cat. Someone covered in gold. Another damn cat. Another diseased with crystals and another concealed in so many flowers they can't see or walk properly. If they can look as stupid as they want, then they must be powerful. That's going to be me, I'm thinking, as my brother searches the house for more edible goods. I'm going to wear clothes like that, I imagine, as my sister digs through the cupboards. I'm going to be a celebrity, I vow, as my brother and sister hug each other in the kitchen and cry. Celebrity is tragic. It's trauma. The bigger the catastrophe, the bigger the flashes. But catastrophe gets shared... It's like a commodity. Attention is a limited resource. There's only so many eyes to tempt. It's like what's left of the Upsalu, I think, as I'm watching the portal on our last day of rations. We've got one more each, my brother says, and I don't want to share. I want all the Upsalu. I'm hungry. So, I hatch a plan as I'm stuffing the last piece into my mouth. My brother flaps his arms in panic and my sister tries to calm him by rubbing his back. We're standing by our doors and lining up the protection stones. One, two, three. I arrange mine faster than ever, as I think of flowers and crystals and ostrich feathers. My brother spends twice the time positioning his with shaking fingers. My sister faux checks them with a stare that pierces right through. Everyone shuts their doors, and I wait in the dark on the other side. I hear them creak into bed and I sit with my back to the door in silence. The moonlight begins to push through the papered windows, and my eyes slowly adjust. I'm a shadow. I'm the dark. I'm unseeable. I'm a ninja on the red carpet. Eventually, I open my door and see the little white circles shimmering on the floor. It takes a moment to snatch my sibling's stones, retreat and toss them in under my bed. I slide into the sheets and smile as I imagine the piles of wondrous costumes I'm going to wear. The next morning I wake up, glide over to the door, grab the handle and pause. I change my smile into a frown, just in case. It's something I've seen the celebrities do. I open the door slowly, half expecting to see my panicked brother and sister looking for their stones and screaming Armageddon. But they're not there. The doors are open. Lights off and windows are exposed by scratch marks and tears. I tiptoe into their rooms with a hesitancy I haven't felt before, and my frown becomes real. It dawns on me that I'm never going to be the last one awake again. I look in one room, and then the other, and see their empty beds and torn up covers. What else would a six-year-old do but run? Fifteen years later, and I'm a celebrity. The sole survivor. The one that got away. Imprisoned by his dwugos. Bereaved by his dwoodles. And living in perpetual tragedy, alone and famous. I frown at the flashing lights and smile when they can't see me. I wear what the hell I want, and perform how the hell I want. I'm sitting in an interview, cameras on me. 
lights enough to make anyone sweat. But not me. I never sweat. They still call me boy too. They ask me what man I'm dating. They ask me what woman I'm dating. They ask me about everything that happened to me over and over and over. Until I'm like a well-acted recording. I tell my story again, with the lines I've rehearsed in front of countless mirrors that I used to call soul catchers. I tell them about my brave brother who kept us going. I tell them about my caring sister who showed us love. Of how I wish I knew where they were or if they still lived. I lap up the attention while my siblings bathe in eternal flame. I tell them of the messed up vocabulary our parents taught us and the threats of heaven and hell. The audience laughs gasps and cries, exactly when they should, and I see their silhouettes enthralled by my remarkable tail, and among them I see the familiar glints of red eyes in the shadows, watching and waiting, unable to drag me home. The slick-haired interviewer on uppers and downers asks me why I always wear those three stones around my neck. I pause, an exact count of five, and I tell him, in an appropriately subdued manner, that they're my lucky charms. They protect me. I kiss each one, look directly into the camera and imagine myself in everyone's portal. I say, one for my brother, one for my sister, and one for me. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. I Do Not Belong Here was written by Michael Pearson and narrated and produced by James Barnett, a.k.a. Jimmy Horace. With music by Dark Fantasy Studio, and Mayu, and Ocular Sounds, and Tom Robson. And sound effects provided by freesound.org and Ghost Hack. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carrion House. A quick thanks to our community managers, Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch. And Joshua Boucher for helping with our submission reading. Fame clings to Ben Errington like static electricity in a cyberstorm of pixels. Michael Pearson writes horror, psychological thriller, opinion pieces, and academic work on mental health and LGBTQ plus experiences. You can find Michael on Instagram at Michael Pierce Writes. James Barnett is the producer of the Night's End podcast and After the Gloaming. Search for them wherever you get your podcasts. You can also catch other works of his at jamesbarnettcreative.com. The Other Stories is a production of the story studio Hawk and Cleaver and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means, share the hell out of it. Until next time. <laughs>